All right, so let's take a look at today's lesson. And you guys should have learned about the Cold War during eighth grade, but I know your eighth grade year got jacked from COVID. Probably, your teacher probably would have taught you the Cold War just as COVID was hitting. But I'm kind of curious, based on maybe what you may have learned about in eighth grade, or maybe what we did earlier this year when we talked about the Soviet Union. Do you guys know anything about the Cold War already? Space race was a big part of this. So what was this race? Okay, right, who could put a person on the moon first? The Soviet Union, the United States, according to the government, I've been told we won that war, right? I'm going to subscribe, to, I'm gonna to subscribe to the fact that that actually happened. I like, gotta believe in something sometimes. I'm not convinced. You're not convinced? Yeah, the Cold War was not an actual war where us and the Soviets fought directly. We often fought indirectly, right? Maybe we arm and train people that are shooting communists, and they arm and shoot and, and they arm and supply people that are shooting capitalists, but we never shoot them directly. Okay, so that's why it's called the Cold War. This is a war of competition and a war of ideas. So the space race is one example of a competition between us and them, right? The two superpowers after World War II is over. How else did we compete with the Russians, the Soviets, during this time? Anyone else remember anything from eighth grade? I want to say the Olympics. The Olympics, the 1980 Olympics. So the 1980 Olympics were a super huge deal, right? The Soviet Union, Russians typically, stereotypically are really good at hockey. And we had this group of amateurs, non-NHL players going up against them in 1980. And they happened in upstate New York at Lake Placid. And we beat them. And that was a huge deal because they always dominated us in hockey, right? So competing with the Russians in sports, a huge deal. How else do we compete with them? Maybe in a, in a more scary way. Any ideas? Sean? Nuclear. Nuclear technology. Who could build more and better nuclear bombs was another way we competed with them. There were also other conflicts associated with the Cold War. Do you guys know the name of like a, a hot war, if you will, where Americans got involved to support a country that was fighting against communism? Forrest Gump participated in it. Korean War and Vietnam War were two examples of a Cold War that was actually hot, just to get confusing sounding. Anyone know anything else about the Cold War? All right, so let's get into it. So let's take a look at these two images here. Right? On the left, we've got a map. And the map key shows two colors and a line, right? On the right-hand side, the pinkish colors says communist country is 1948. And then the tannish color says non-communist country is 1948. And then the black line says Iron Curtain. So just based on this map alone, can we kind of infer what this Iron Curtain thing was? If someone just gave you this picture and that word said, okay, define Iron Curtain, what would you say? Okay, that's a valid inference. Maybe some places could have iron and some couldn't. Perfectly valid. Okay, yeah, maybe it's a border, right? So this is the border that separated the communist and non-communist parts of Europe. Okay, what I want you to add to that is not an actual wall or curtain. This is, this is something that often trips kids up with the Cold War unit, okay? Because everyone, I shouldn't say everyone, because your again, your eighth grade year got kind of messed up. But when most people think Cold War, they do think in their heads about a wall that was built during the Cold War. What wall was that? Rhymes with Sherlin Tall. Sean, the Berlin Wall, okay? That was a tiny wall that separated a city, one little city in Eastern Germany. Notice I'm saying Eastern Germany. There were two Germanys during the Cold War. Okay, so this is simply like a symbolic border that separated. This is not, there was no wall that stretched from Denmark to Italy. Okay, this is just the dividing line between the countries that embraced communism, right? Dictatorship, government owns and operates everything versus the countries that maintain capitalism. And like everything else, there is an exception to a rule, right? I see Greece and Turkey here kind of to the right of that line. They almost became communist, but we did some stuff to prevent them from, from becoming communist. And we'll talk about why and how we did that uh, a little bit more tomorrow. Take a look at the right-hand side. I've got a picture here. I see the word Europe kind of cut off because I'm looking at a, an actual curtain being laid across it. Right? I can see it's a curtain because it's being lifted up. It's not iron. You know, it looks like there's like nails through it. Like it could be iron. And I see a curtain rod here. And I see some stuff going on in the background. I see a flag and I see some smokestacks. You guys know that logo by now. What country is represented with that logo? 
the hammer and sickle logo. That's the Soviet Union's flag right there. And I see a bunch of smokestacks. So what's going on behind that curtain? Like, what are they doing back there? Could be, absolutely could be a power plant. Could be factories as well. Either one is valid, okay? Who, let's get some more context. Who's the Soviet Union's leader that brought those factories and all that industry to the Soviet Union? Joseph Stalin, right? Five-year plans. And so that kind of makes sense here why this says Joe. No admittance by order, Joe. What does this word, what does no admittance mean? If I'm not admitting you to something, right? And we talked about some political cartoons recently. I showed you guys Hitler and Stalin had the, the mustaches, right? And I said, in the future, you're gonna see a political cartoon with another guy who's gonna be short and stocky, have a cigar in his mouth, and have a bald head. Who's the person, if I tell you this is the 1940s that this cartoon came out, late 1940s, British speaking person, short, stocky, leader of Britain, cigar in his mouth. His first name is also the first name of one of the Ghostbusters. He goes to, he goes to religious services on top of a hill. <laughs> Kathleen? Winston Churchill, yeah. So looks like Churchill's trying to get a peek under there, but no admittance. And I also see that this curtain is stretching across train tracks. So can we infer anything based off this cartoon? Like if you were asked to describe what happened to Europe during the Cold War, what could you conclude just based on this cartoon? Imagine you're a historian in the future and you're trying to tell the past, like what the heck happened in Europe? And this is your source of information. You know nothing else. What could you infer based on this picture? Okay, right, so perhaps travel was restricted. Let's put it down, really good inference. Somebody else tell me how you think she came to that conclusion. What's in that cartoon that could support the claim that travel bans or restrictions were put in place? Priya? The railroad. the railroad being cut off, right? It looks like that curtain is stretching right across. Maybe there was a railroad between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, right? Eastern Europe is where Russia would be. Perhaps now it's being blocked off. Can we imply or infer rather anything else from the cartoon that would evoke, you know, what happened during that time? Division, right? And maybe animosity between both sides. Ooh, okay. So Soviet Union became modernized. I would absolutely agree with that when I apply actual historical knowledge to it, All right? Despite America supposedly getting to, I'm gonna, I subscribe to that, it actually happened. So I'm gonna say it, right? We got to the moon first. They put things in outer space long before we did. Freaked us re out really bad in 1957 when the Soviets launched uh, a, a tiny little tin can that had a radio beep attached to it. It used to circle the planet, it's called Sputnik. And when Americans saw this flying object and knew that the Soviets launched it and we had nothing to compete with that, we started putting bomb shelters in our backyards and we're like, yo, we're falling behind. I thought we we're supposed to be superior. Kind of kicked us into high gear to catch up with them. Okay, so absolutely, the Soviet Union becomes a modern country during this time way ahead in some areas, not in others, in a lot of others. Excellent, anything else? Yeah, no trade between Western and Eastern Europe. Does the cartoon imply that there was open communication between the two sides, or perhaps not so much? What do you think, Brie? Yeah, I would agree with you. Not much communication between both sides. The Cold War was shrouded in secrecy. We didn't, oh, I'm sorry guys, we're out of time. Okay, we will pick this up tomorrow, my apologies. So, as World War II is coming to an end, a couple of conferences were held between the allied leaders, right? So it's Roosevelt, it's Churchill, it's Stalin. Which two meetings were held to determine the fate of Germany after World War II? Yalta and Potsdam conferences. You can call them conferences, you can call them meetings. The point is, the leaders got together, they're meeting to discuss what should we do when this is over? What can we put in place to prevent World War III? And how should we deal with Germany yet again? To try to like, avoid the repetition, right? Because we tried to punish Germany the first time, but maybe that punishment led to the rise of the Nazis. So we're gonna do things maybe a little bit differently this time. So speaking of Germany, what happens to Germany after World War II? Demilitarize. How else is Germany affected? Yeah, this is the biggest one. Split into four occupied zones. Meaning, I'll show you a map, if you, if, if you took a look at this, right, when the war was over, this is what happens to Germany. Four different sections, each run by a different allied power. Okay, you had the French section in purple over here, this is the US section, the British controlled section, 
and the Soviet-controlled section. A couple years into the Cold War, these three would come together and form a new country called West Germany, and this would be known as East Germany. Right, so the thought was, well, Germany, when it's all united, is when Germany is strong, right? Remember that Otto von Bismarck character? He's like, let's unite all the Germans, and then the German nation will be strong. Well, if we break it apart, they won't be so strong anymore, right? A, a, a East Germany, this little chunk of land, cannot go off into the world to try to build an empire. It's not going to work. So Stalin breaks a promise. What's that broken promise? Very good. He did not allow, I'll show you, I'll explain what this means in a second, Eastern Europe to have free elections. In parentheses, I want you to write self-determination. We've used that term before, right? It's, the, it's this idea that the people in a country should have the right to create and run their own government without interference. So as World War II was coming to an end, if you remember, right, after the Battle of Stalingrad, I'll put the words back up in a second, the Soviets were charging towards Berlin. It's not like they just kept going and didn't leave anybody behind. All this area, all, this, all these parts of Eastern Europe had Soviet soldiers in them. And people were concerned, like, well, what's going to happen when the war is over? Will Poland be independent again? Or will Poland just be part of Russia? And Stalin promised to give all these people the right to create their own governments, just to kind of appease Roosevelt and, um, and Churchill to get them off his back. But now the war is over, and Stalin forces all these countries to have communist governments. Why? Okay, so I have rule over them, and how might, how might that benefit him? Again, well, in theory, what could he might maybe get from owning them? The same, th more maybe more power, right? Because what, what could generate all that power? All right, money. Well, what, what kinds of things do you need to have to, in order to generate money? Because it, it's, you could just grab the cash, granted, but you could probably also generate additional income if you can control what? Natural resources, factories, okay, absolutely. He also wants to build what we're going to call a buffer zone between the Soviet Union and his enemies in the West. Any idea what a buffer zone might mean or what a buffer is? Right? He's going to force all these countries to fight on his behalf. So if the Western Europeans ever tried to evade the Soviet Union, there'd be other countries whose people have to die first. How nice for them. So let's make sure we have that in our answer. Okay, so why? The second part here. He wanted to build a buffer zone between USSR and Western Europe. Okay, we shall all know what the Cold War is. Absolutely, a period of competition between USA and USSR, right? It's a Cold War. There's no direct confrontation between the two sides. We're competing over who can get to the moon first, who can build the most nuclear weapons, who could beat the other team in the Olympics. Right, to try to prove to the world which system is best. Is it capitalism and democracy? Or is it dictatorship and communism? Okay, so if we can win in those areas, it kind of demonstrates maybe the superiority of that particular system. Section two, the competing goals. They want something, we want something. What does the Soviet Union want to do during the Cold War? Absolutely, right? Want to spread communism. Number one goal. Sabrina, what does the United States want to do? Contain communism. And contain means exactly what, it's, what it sounds like. You've heard that word before. But when applied to the Cold War, what does containment mean? Stop it from spreading. Okay, so in this context, it means to stop the spread of communism. We make a decision as a country, wherever communism already is, we're going to leave it there. We're not going to try to invade and overturn it, because that's just going to provoke another world war. But we will prevent communism from spreading. Oftentimes kids ask me, why do we care so much? Right? Why did we send people to Vietnam and Korea to stop the spread of communism? You got to think of it from the point of view of countries that are wealthy and people that are wealthy. Right? If I'm wealthy, if I own land and I have money, why is communism the last thing I want in my life? If you have wealth and land and power, you don't want communism. And countries that have a lot of wealthy people don't want that to happen either, right? Because regular everyday people aren't going to want that switch. They want to keep their stuff. It's the poor countries that are at risk of becoming communists, right? With a bunch of desperate people who have nothing. So when someone tells a poor person with nothing that they're going to take from the rich person and give it to you, you're like, sign me up. All right? So the countries, again, who want the wealth are going to do whatever they, who have the wealth rather, are going to do whatever they can to stop communism from taking hold. So we do it in a, in a number of different ways. This is the first way. Two different policies that do the same thing, the Truman Doctrine 
and the Marshall Plan, right? Give everyone a Marshall Store credit card, right? Now, what did we do with these policies? Okay, right, so very good. Countries that recover from war will be able to resist the threat of communism. So now with these plans, what do we do to help them recover? Military, political, and economic aid or assistance. Okay, and when I say economic aid, I'm just talking cash money, you know. Give the countries cash, because wealthy countries don't want to be communist. And countries that are non-communist are more likely to trade with the United States. Okay, and this worked in, in the Western European countries. When World War II was over, we pumped them full of cash, helped them rebuild their factories. People are prospering again, and they have powerful militaries again. So powerful militaries can put down communist threats. And again, there's no incentive to want to become communist because you have the wealth. Okay, the countries that we see in the world that turn to communism don't last very long as trading partners with the United States. So again, you want to also have those countries that are willing to trade with you. NATO, we know about NATO, we've been talking about NATO. It's current, it's in the news. North Atlantic Treaty Organization, right? That's what it stands for. And now what is it? A military alliance. So how would this, in theory, help prevent the spread of communism? Exactly, if one attacked, they would all attack. This is what NATO is like today, right? So if the Soviet Union attacked any one of these countries with the intent of spreading communism, all the other countries in NATO would jump in and stop that from happening. Right, this is a military threat, basically. If you try to spread communism to another country, we are going to attack you. So they, we create a military alliance that we participate in. We're still in it, it still exists. And the Soviet Union is like, well, if you're gonna have that, we're gonna have our own. What was the Soviet version of that called? Warsaw Pact. Okay, Warsaw is a city in Poland. Which countries were in the Warsaw Pact? They all have one thing in common that the reading mentioned, that they, are, they were all a specific type of state. They were all in Europe, okay, so these were Eastern European countries that were satellite states, AKA, another word we used for that previously was puppet states, I'll explain in a second, of the USSR. We talked about puppet states during World War II, right? We said when the Nazis controlled France, they put a puppet government in charge, meaning they put a French person in charge, but the French person had to listen to whatever the Nazis said. That's exactly what took place here, right? After World War II, Stalin controlled these countries, forced them to be communist. So even though Poland ran itself, they were forced to put a person in charge that the Soviet Union liked. And now they're forced to be in a military alliance with the Soviet Union. Okay, so if Italy decided to invade Romania, and make Romania non-communist, the Soviet Union and all these other countries would attack Italy. Okay, so things got kind of scary because the entire world looked like it was taking a side one way or the other. And throughout the entire Cold War, they were trying to win over the countries who couldn't decide. They were really trying to push India to take a position. Hey, India, be part of NATO. Hey, India, be part of the Warsaw Pact. Here's some money, here's some help. Whatever you want, just, do, just join our side. The Division of Berlin I'll show you a map in a second, and again, some good videos. Where was Berlin during the Cold War? In which country? Okay, located in USSR controlled area. That is very true. In which specific USSR controlled area? East Germany. East Germany. So this is a wacky plan they came up with uh, at the end of World War II. If you look at this map here, despite the fact that Berlin was split into a communist and non-communist section, the entire city was in the Soviet controlled zone. Right, so imagine that situation, right? Berlin is split in half. That means there are a couple of counties, a couple of neighborhoods where you could elect your own leaders and own and operate your own business. But you are surrounded entirely by communism, constantly under the threat of Joseph Stalin and his allies. So these people are scared out of their minds. And what do you think Stalin wants to do? Do you think Stalin's happy with this situation? No. So what do you think Stalin wants to occur here? Go ahead. He wants to take over all of them? Yeah, he would rather this not be the case. He would rather that the West Berliners either die or say, fine, we will submit to communism. So he tries something to make that happen. What does Stalin do? This is the next question. What does Stalin do to try to force the people of West Berlin Okay, this little, these little communities here 
to become communist. Yeah, he puts up a blockade. Okay, a blockade is like something that's a, you know, a barrier in the road systems. So they were roads and railroads that ran from West Germany to West Berlin to keep these people supplied, right? Because they couldn't count on being able to trade with communists. So Stalin's like, I got an idea. Destroy the roads and railroads. These people will either starve to death or say, fine, we give up, we'll be communists. But that, wasn't the end, that was not the end of the story. What did the United States do to try to keep West Berlin from submitting to communism? Kathleen? They airlifted, they airlifted food. For 11 months, every couple of minutes, literally every couple of minutes, the United States would fly planes to West Berlin, drop off supplies, fly the plane back, back home, or maybe not home, but somewhere back in West Germany for a resupply, and then fly back. Stalin let this go on for 11 months before he said, fine, forget it. I'll let the roads and railroads run again. You tell me. Think critically about the situation that we're learning about. Stalin could have just shot the planes down. Simple. But he did not. He let them keep going and going. Why didn't Stalin just shoot the planes down? Makes no sense to me. Right? We've had maybe direct conflict. Maybe the Cold War becomes a hot war. And what's the context of the times, guys? What's that fancy new weapon that both sides now have that threatened to blow up a lot of people? The nuclear bombs. Okay? So we're trying to avoid catastrophe, trying to avoid World War III, trying to avoid a nuclear attack, but we seem to want to and be willing to go right to the edge of that, right? Try to push them as hard as we can without actually causing them to launch nuclear weapons. So this was a a tension period for 11 months, but eventually Stalin backs down. But then, back to the wall, so West Berlin remains independent. They do their own thing. Imagine you're living in East Berlin, right? Your neighbors across the street can pick their own leaders and run their own business. What do you think East Berliners decide to do, right? Try desperately to find an apartment or a house for sale and live here where things are good. But that's bad publicity for communism, right? This is the Cold War. It's a war of competition. Prove to the world that you have the best system. Doesn't look good when people are like, I'm out of here, right? Let me go live in the freedom side. So what was built, again, it's also bad publicity, what was built to prevent the East Berliners from escaping and going to freedom? The Berlin Wall, okay? Supposedly, this is real. If you think this is rare, it's not. The Berlin Wall was massive, and it got bulldozed down in 1987, and there were bajillions of these Berlin Wall rocks around. It smells like starvation. I'm gonna pass this around in case you're interested. It's just average everyday concrete. They put up that wall to stop people from escaping communism, okay? At first, it was a wall like five feet high. It was like nothing. It's like, oh, oh, oh there's a wall here. By the 1980s, it's a wall. It's booby traps, it's barbed wire, it's sniper rifles, it's spikes in the ground to prevent you from running to the other side. And people did escape, people dug tunnels, people escaped using hot air balloons, true story. And I'll, I'll share more about that with you later, but uh, not a good situation. You wanna talk about enduring issues, right? This could be, a, again, an example of lack of freedom or a denial of the freedom of movement. And it separated families, right? Imagine if they built like a wall separating Long Island into two. Nassau, Suffolk County, maybe you guys have family in the other county that you can no longer ever see. Okay, that's, the, that's how it was for the Berliners. Okay, more Cold War stuff. Arms and space races. What's an arms race? Competition, I'm just gonna paraphrase that. To build the most and best weapons. In parentheses, I'm gonna put atomic bombs because that's the biggest one. Who could build the biggest and the best? As the war progresses, they get way more intense, right? Hydrogen bombs make an appearance. It's a different type of nuclear weapon. It becomes a war, a situation where you could strap a nuke to a rocket, put the rocket into space, into orbit, and then drop it down. That's called an ICBM rocket. So things are pretty crazy. They, they could blow us up without even having to leave home and vice versa. Why did that start? Why did both stars start building as many as they possibly could? What was the trigger for that event? That's true. Each were trying to outdo each other who could build the biggest and the best, but why? Like, what began that race to do so? Yeah, when America dropped bombs on Japan during World War II. Stalin is sitting there going, what the F just happened? Why don't we have that? We need that. If they have that and we go to war with them, we're done. So let's match them and then exceed them. And America's like, well, we can't let him have more than us. We have to match him and exceed him. Eventually, it got to a point, and if you read this section, you know what I'm talking about, where both sides decided it's actually in everyone's best interest 
this is going to sound weird, it's in everyone's best interest if each side has enough to completely annihilate the other side in its entirety. Meaning they have enough to wipe out every single American and we have enough to wipe out every single Russian. In theory, why could that maybe work? Yeah, there's no winner then, right? If we have enough to wipe out them and we launch and they have enough to wipe out us and they launch, no one's left standing. It's complete, you're, everyone's done. The whole planet is probably done. Okay, that's a theory called mutually assured destruction. People thought it's a good thing that both sides have enough to wipe out everybody. But it, it got to think about that, right? That depends on people with rational thought processes. But what if you get some kind of psychopath one day breaking in and going, click, 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 click. It's like, well, damn, some people just want to see the world burn. It's from a Batman movie, I think. All right, so again, the using of the atomic bomb in Japan is what triggers this arms race. But there were other races as well. Uh, well, first of all, how do people living in both places react? A lot of fear, absolutely. What do we do in response to that fear? Bomb shelters in their backyards, air raid drills. I never had to partake in this, even though technically when I started going to school, the Cold War was still on for one more year, my first year of kindergarten. Uh, but it used to be not just fire drills, it could be air raid drills, meaning a different type of sound and you would be diving under your desk. It's not gonna save you if the bombs dropped right on stage in East, but if someone were to bomb, I don't know, Manhattan, we would feel the aftershocks of that. Ceiling tiles might fall and stuff. So maybe if you're under your desk and a ceiling tile falls, maybe your head doesn't get hit. Maybe you have a chance. Maybe. All right, so space race. Why do we have a space race? What triggered that? Yeah. Sputnik into orbit. Okay, Sputnik, or Sputnik if you speak Russian, is a tin can with antennas on it that emitted a beep sound over radio waves. That's all it was. And they put, it, they put it on a rocket and they blasted the rocket into Earth's orbit and this tin can just flew around the planet going beep, beep, beep. So they put a tin can into Earth's orbit. It circles the planet. Americans are freaking out. This is 1957 because it looks like we've got nothing going on in our space program and the Soviets have something that in theory could just fly over your house and drop a bomb on your head. We can't compete with that. So this triggers us to create our space organization that we still have designed to outdo the Russians and eventually beat them to the moon. That becomes our major priority. What's that organization? NASA, okay? So we decide we're gonna get to the moon first and we do beat them supposedly in 1969, we get there first.